Welcome back to the Immigration Answer Show. It's your boy, Jim Hacking. Hope you all are doing well. Hope everybody's having a great Thursday. We're having a great day here at Hacking Immigration Law. This is episode number 319 of the Immigration Answer Show. Who here has been here since day one? Who's been here since day 20? Who, who's been watching this show for more than a year? Go ahead and let us know in the comments where you're watching from. Let us know how long you've been watching. Let us know if we've been able to help you over time. Hope we've been able to help you. I see some people posting their good news. I see Michael's in San Salt Lake City. Raphael's in Tampa. Sheldon, of course, is here. Melvin has good news. Oh, we'll have to get Melvin on. We's watching from Florida as usual. Melvin says he has good news. Let's start with Melvin. What's up, Melvin? Hi, Jim. How are you? Good. What's the good news? You got that visa? Uh, so after you and I spoke the last time, I decided to send them an email, reply to the email, uh, letting them know that the 221G I received was in mine. Yeah, yeah. And then the next day, they sent me the correct one that my wife should drop off her passport. That's yeah. all you, man. That's all you. You did a great job. Yeah. So it's like I'm going to bring her back when I go when I leave on Monday. It's like I'm going to bring her along with me. So. Good. And then when you get back from Liberia, you should enroll in law school because you'd be a hell of a lawyer. I'll try. <laughs> All I'm right. For you. All right. Well, let us know when she gets here. OK. All right. Thanks. Bye, Melvin. Thanks for the good news, buddy. All right. Old Melvin. He really had to fight to get that visa issued. If you haven't heard Melvin's story, it's quite a tale. But he basically he basically got the government in Liberia to apologize to him and to the State Department for some problems with the person who was issuing marriage certificates in Liberia. All right. All right. Again, let us know where you're watching from. Let us know how much, how long you've been watching. And we're going to go ahead and talk to Teeny. Hello, you're on mute. There you go. Hi, Jim. How are you? I am good. What's up? Yeah. So I'm talking about my friend. Sure. Yeah. Um, it about married license with green card. So she and her spouse met outside of the US. And because of COVID, he came back and then decided not to go back to that country. But coincidentally, she also got the scholarship for her master program in the same state. And um, then her parent came to the U.S. to join her for her graduation. And he proposed at that time. And then they decided to get married. Cool. So, but it was her second time in the U.S. So my question for short, whether like uh, they haven't done the um, I of uh, filing the I-130 and the ch uh, adjustment of the status yet, but she wanted to know whether she should um, disclose her immigration history before or just like, just don't care, just submit what they ask from the application. So this person came to the United States on an F1, right? Yeah. Correct. When did they start school? Um, May or June 2021. And when they started school in June 2021, were they already married or did they get married later? Uh, they just got married in December 2022. And has this person left the United States since June of 21? No. So person comes on an F1 student visa. Oh, I see what you're saying. So, so they had this relationship. So, so let me see if I got it right. So we'll talk about Jim and Amani. So Jim is a U.S. citizen. Jim lives in St. Louis. Amani lives in Egypt. That's my wife's real name. Amani lives in Egypt. And we have this thing sort of cooking. We're not married or anything, but we like each other. And Jim lives in St. Louis, Missouri. Amani comes to school at Washington University in uh, St. Louis. No. So um, Jim also stay in the... Um, Jim lived in Egypt for a while. Yeah, worked in there for a while. But they weren't married? No. 
So then Jim comes back and Jim's doing his little thing in St. Louis. And then Amani comes to school in St. Louis and she goes to school for a year and a half and then they get married. And the question is whether they should talk about their old relationship in Egypt before they came. Right. Yeah. Is, is, uh, Amani going to keep going to school now that they're married or they're going to stop going to school? Uh, she's already graduated and then she's on OPT now. Perfect. Yeah. Tell the whole, I mean, always tell the truth to immigration, but this in particular, they don't need to worry about. Okay. I mean, the only way it unravels is if USCIS thinks that she lied to get her F1 student visa, but she came, she got a master's and she went on OPT. So when, when did she start on F1 status in the first place? Was it when she came the first time? No. So she came to the first time under J1. So, and mm -hmm. also funded by US state, US Department of State, and these have their two year. So she did her two years. Yeah. She completed her two years. And now she's on status on OPT. They just got married in December and then they want to file to change the adjustment of status. So, and I mean, I, they, might want to, they might want to use a lawyer, but they should go ahead. No problem. They'll be fine. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I just want to know because I just uh, watched your video a day ago that they starting to like schedule an interview and then they just send the intent. So I just worried with the, they should submit a lot of doc they should, they should. Yeah. I would include old stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It just shows the relationship. I mean, as long as they weren't legally married in Egypt or wherever before they came, I think it's fine. Yeah. I think uh, before she thought that like, it is like kind of cold and incident that she got admitted to the school in the same state. Well, his hometown. well, I'd be I'd be a little bit careful about that because that's the kind of thing that might piss him off if you say it was a coincidence. I just wouldn't even bring it up. I would just say, yeah, he was living in Missouri. Yeah, I came to grad school in Missouri. And and I wouldn't say it was a coincidence because no one's going to believe that, even if it's true. Yeah, because like, like, um, like if she applied to 10 schools and that was the only one she got in, then that's a coincidence. But otherwise, they're going to think that she was cooking it up so that she could be by him. And they're not going to care, though as long as she never lied to anybody. Okay. And like I said, she actually graduated and she actually went on OPT. So it's not like where you really get in trouble about lying on your F1 stuff is when you, when this is what people do, that's dumb. They, <clears throat> they go to the embassy, they get the F1, they go to the same state as their boyfriend or girlfriend, then they fly to America and then they never go to school and they never get a degree and they never do OPT. That's when you get in trouble. That's that's a whole lot closer to fraud because you never really fulfilled the basis or the reason they gave you the visa in the first place. So I think your friend is fine. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. See ya. Yeah. All right. All right. My friend Huli's uh, watching the the chat. Uh, Heron says that Heron watched 80 shows so far. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. We should probably give out an award. We've been thinking about giving out an award. Tell me what you think for caller of the week. Caller of the week, and I think we might want to give an award for the most chill caller of the week because everyone likes it when we get that person going like this, laying on their couch. What's up, Jim? How you doing? And then they sort of get up and walk outside because they don't want anyone. Vadim's been watching for a long time. We know that. Vadim's been watching for a long time, long time. All right, let's say hi to John. What's up, John? How you doing, Jim? I'm well. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Hey, uh, I recently started watching your show, and uh, uh, it came to my attention. I have uh, uh, two questions for you. I uh, I uh, did an interview for my N400 uh, uh, October October the fifth, 2021, and up uh, until this point, I haven't heard nothing uh, yet. Uh, and I was, how'd, the interview, how'd the interview go? Where was it? Which field office? It was, uh, I live in uh, Northern Virginia and uh, it was in uh, DC. Okay. Yeah, Fairfax. And and what? how did you get your green card? Uh, I got a, uh, it was through a, uh, my mother. Okay. And so how long was your interview and what, did anything unusual come up? Is there anything that you're worried about? Well, uh, 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 at first, 
when I came into this country, I was uh, 12 years old. Uh, it was around 1998. And, uh, and it was some, it, it happened something uh, weird happened. They assigned me uh, a different alien number than, uh, than the one that they ended up giving me the uh, green card. So uh, with one, they, they, did, uh, they gave me a deportation and, uh, but, but I ended up, I ended up uh, getting everything uh, fixed. Uh, the case was reopened, terminated, and closed. Uh, that was the first time I realized that was going on. Uh, it was on the first time I applied for the citizenship in 2018. But then, uh, when, when, did that, when did when did that happen? When did you actually get your green card? Uh, it was on 2001. I got it in 2001. Okay. So, so I reapplied. Uh, after I fixed all the issues, I reapplied. Well, well, what happened? So this is your second naturalization application? Y yes. Why? What was the stated reason? Why did they say in the decision that they denied it? Oh, the, oh, the first one, the first one, they say they denied it because I had a, a order to removal. Oh. Uh, yeah. Oh. Which okay. it was. Open. That's why uh, I hired a lawyer. And she, uh, she did a motion to reopen it, terminate it and close it and everything was done after everything was done successfully after yeah, yeah. i uh reapplied for the n400 and uh i did the interview on on october the 5th 2021 that's a long and, time ago yeah it's about 16 months about yeah. to be 17 months so that was my my question my first question uh what do you think i should do well, so, did you did so so did a lawyer file your N four hundred or did you file it on your own? Um, uh, a lawyer, the same lawyer who uh, did the the case. So, so they know what they're doing. Yeah, yeah. So here's the thing: Do you know about the hundred and twenty day rule? Yeah, I, I research about it. So you're uh, well past that. So if you if you if you, I mean, we sue that Northern District or we sue that that Northern Virginia office all the time. So if you sue them, you'll probably get a decision in about. Mm, 45 days, maybe 60 days at the most. They they move pretty quickly. I don't know if it's going to be an approval or a denial. I haven't yeah. seen everything. But are you are you saying that are you saying that you had a green card and then you applied for naturalization after you had your green card and then they said you're you still have a deportation case pending and then she reopened it and terminated it. Yes. And then but nobody did anything with your green card. No, no, nobody did anything. Uh, as a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, I, I I traveled twice out of the country uh, with that green card. I just came to realize this was going on the first sure. time I applied yeah. for the realization. Yeah. Well, like I'm pretty sure that you'll get a decision. It sounds like it'll be an approval. I can't guarantee it, but I can get you a decision. There no, they they can't when you. So there's a special rule for citizens, just for other people that don't know, that if you've had your interview for naturalization and 120 days go by, you can go into court on day 121 and ask a judge to naturalize you or to decide. So I think you probably, now that it's 16, 17 months, you, you need to sue them. Okay. You think that that should be a, a good choice? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, and uh, about that, um, uh, uh, do I have to call your office? You, you, uh, you guys uh, say that you guys have an, an office over here on the D.C. area. Yeah, but we do these lawsuits all over the country. Um, we we are licensed in federal court in many courts. We have local counsel. So, yeah, we, we, we sue them there all the time. It doesn't matter where you are. Um, we can totally handle it for sure. OK. And, and the other question is that uh, uh, I heard about the uh, um, ombudsman, I believe, uh, but I heard you say that that doesn't even work anymore. Nope. nope. Okay. All right. So about pricing, should I call your office? To I'll see tell you. What? I'll tell you what the price is. So the filing fee is four hundred and two dollars, and our fee is forty six hundred dollars. So it's five thousand and two dollars. If you pay up front, you say five hundred dollars. So then it's forty five oh two. If okay. you want a payment plan, we need three thousand and two up front. And then it's 500 a month for four months. Okay. All right. All right. All cool. right. Yeah. Just give us a call or send us an email and say, my, make sure to tell them you were on the video that you're John Doe and that you're on around the 10 minute mark so that they can go back and watch it before they call you. And then they'll just, they'll just say, I'm John Doe. I was on the show. It rhymes. 
right. All right. All right. Thanks. Appreciate it. You got it, bud. Thanks a lot. All right. That was interesting. Hey, I saw somebody said in the questions, hey, Jim, what do you think about filing? Here it is. What do you think about filing a lawsuit against USCIS pro se? So for those of you who don't know, pro se means without a lawyer. I don't think you can pull it off. I know lots of lawyers who are who can't pull off a pro se lawsuit. I also think uh, USCIS doesn't take it very seriously when you file it without a lawyer. Um, the very first green card lawsuit I did was taking over a case for a kid that had filed a pro se uh, green card case and the U.S. attorney was playing lots of tricks on him. So I don't recommend it. Um, <clears throat> all right. Uh, yeah, if you got 60 seconds and you like watching the show, if you could leave us a five-star review at reviewhackinglaw.com, we would greatly appreciate it. Let's say hi to James. Hi, James. Hey, James. Uh, hey, Jim. Sorry. How you doing? Good, uh, good. Thanks for taking my question. Sure. Um, I received my green card. It was an employment-based green card at the end of 2018. So um, I'll be applying for naturalization at the end of this year. Cool. Um, however, in the meantime, I got uh, Portuguese citizenship and I also got uh, Spanish citizenship. Um, I just wanted to know if that would affect in any way when I submit the N-400, whether I should, whether that would affect uh, the application in any way and whether I have to disclose that in any way and where should I do that? I know there's a place that says citizenship. So I'm, I'm from Mexico, by the way. So I just I would just put Mexico because that's what all my immigration paperwork is from. Yeah. But I don't know if I have to bring that up at any point. You should. Yeah, I would I would do a, an addition sheet at the end of the N-400 that says I've also I also became a citizen of Portugal on this day, a citizen of what is it? Spain. Is that what you said? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I would list those and then just leave it at that. Oh, okay, but it wouldn't affect and it wouldn't like disqualify me from naturalization or anything, right? No, I just did one of those the other day. I just had someone who was a citizen of two countries and it's, it's they just ask, they'll just ask you, James, which country do you want to have on your naturalization certificate? And so you'll probably want to say Mexico. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, that's great. Yeah, thank cool. you very much. You got it. Have a good day. You too. All right. All right. Let's see what Mike P has to say. Hi, Mike. You're on mute. Hey, yeah, um, I have a bit of a problem. So I'm not sure if, uh, if you'd be able to give me some advice with this, but I came here on an F1 visa and I initially came to be, uh, to go to become an aircraft mechanic. I didn't con uh, continue that program and I ended up switching to flight school, which I did finish. And um, the, well, the airlines in the US, they require 1,500 hours minimum flight time, which I, I already have. So I pretty much have all of the requirements for uh, all of the major airlines and the regional airlines to get a job. And um, I got an offer from um, a small airline that was willing to sponsor me an EB3 visa. But unfortunately, when I was finished with flight school, I did transfer to another school um, just to buy some, you know, to attend school. But the main purpose was to buy myself additional time while I was searching for opportunities like that. So what ended up happening is I... You mean you, mean, you, mean you had a legitimate reason to go to school and it happened to have the byproduct of giving you more time is what you meant to say, right? Exactly. That's what I meant to say. Thank you. Um, and what happened is um, I am not sure about if I would be able to maintain my status due to some financial reasons, um, which means I there's a chance that I would go out of status. Um, so I was wondering if it would be impossible for me to file this case with um, this airline for the EB3 visa if I'm out of status or, you know, what would my situation be? You won't be able to adjust status if you're not currently in status, not on an employment basis. No. All right. So the only, the only way that I can adjust status if I'm out of status is if it was through family based. Right. Or you could leave the United States. Yeah. And when you're, you know, you'd have to do an immigrant visa that way. Um, mm -hmm. That you know, and then you wouldn't accrue any unlawful presence. You wouldn't be here without status. I see. Okay. All right. Um, all right, Jim. Well, thank you very much for your help. You're welcome, Mike. Have a good day. All right. Have a good day. See ya.
All right, Marshall's up next. Marshall, are you with us? Yes, I'm here, Jim. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? I'm well, thank um, you. I filed a um, I-30 um, last year, March last year, 2022, and I still didn't get back no answer yet from um, USCIS. Is it for an overseas case? Yes, it is. And which service center is it pending at? Nebraska. Yeah, you've probably got about a month or two left. Okay. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be worried. Okay. All right, thank you. Oh, that was easy. See ya. Yeah. All right, that was Marshall. Let's say to Oscar. What is up, Oscar? Hey, Jim, thank you for doing this show. Sure. Uh, I have uh, just three questions that I want to ask if you allow me. Go for it. It's mostly like to employment-based visa cut the side. So first, I and my girlfriend apply for EB3, other worker category separately. Same employer, but separate applications. Now we are planning to get married soon. Once we get married, so do we have to notify the USCIS and can we add each other to each other's case? So are I-140s and 45s on file or just I-140? I-140 was approved. EA, both of our EADs were approved. It's just pending right now there for 85. So why make it all? Why make it more complicated by added, trying to add each other, you to each other's applications? Yeah, so that's what I thought. And then uh, sec, it, it brings me second question. Let's say, God forbid, nothing happens. Everything will go smoothly. So one of our gets denied. So what, what then we have, like, what kind of options? Should, should, we, should we go, like, the person who denied go back to the country and make an adjustment through consular? Or even though the case is on um, appealing stage, we can add to each other? What, well, appeals are worthless. So here's what I would say about that, Oscar. I've been an immigration lawyer for 15 years, mm -hmm. and I've never had the situation that you're describing happen mm -hmm. where two people applied for employment-based green cards and then got married and then one got denied. So my answer to you is I'd have to do some research to figure out next steps, mm -hmm. but probably that's when you would want to add mm -hmm. the, the person who lost to the other person's application. And at that stage, the appealing will be like the grounds of that, like a status that your site will consider it, like let's say appeal it and then get married to green card holder. Will that help to adjust it? Since she she will not pay like like U.S. citizen, obviously. So. Okay, again, that's something I'd have to research. Uh, okay, I can't okay, tell okay. you for sure. Hey Jim, the, then then last one. So before I'm coming to the U.S., my English was not good. I'm not sure. My DS one sixty filed by my friend. I came to F one and then. Uh oh, delivery. oh, here it comes. Go ahead. Yeah. So and right now, not sure. Like if he listed all my previous jobs, I, I'm. I've been asking to that guy. Hey, what, what happened? Did you list that? That she said. He said, Yeah, I listed. And when per my application, I listed all of them. So right now, I'm not sure because he obviously has no screenshot, nothing. And when I get there, is, is it a big deal? Firstly, and secondly, all, all I, prior jobs is not something that's probably going to be on anybody's radar. I don't think that. I mean, if you told me that. I don't know if my friend listed my two earlier wives, that'd be a little bit different, but I oh, think, yeah. I don't think anyone's going to get too, like, I don't think anybody's going to get too worked up that you didn't list some job flipping hamburgers or something. Uh, but, but uh, the mm -hmm. one thing I would suggest if you're really anxious about this is you can do a freedom of information act request for your DS 160 from the state department. Not oh. the easiest thing in the world to get. They don't always send it. They don't always send the complete thing to you, but you might be able to get it. And that might make you feel better later on when you have your green card interview. And then there is no job listed. So when I get to the interview, just tell the officer or just wait if he asks. Always. No. Well, first. OK. So first of all, don't ever tell the officer anything that they don't ask. Mm -hmm. And second of all, always tell the truth. So even if you forgot to list a job back mm -hmm. then, mm -hmm. let, let's say that let's say that buddy boy who filled out your DS-160 didn't list your job at McDonald's mm -hmm. and then you show up. And you purposely don't tell the officer about your job at McDonald's. Mm -hmm. And and they say, did you ever have any other job before you went to fill out your DC? Oh, DS-160. Oh, no. And they say, well, what about this job at McDonald's? Mm -hmm. And then they think you're lying. And then you get in trouble for something that's not important. And that's a mm -hmm. real thing at immigration and at, and at the State Department is when you lie about something you don't need to lie about, you can still get denied for that. 
Ah, okay, okay, thank you. And lastly, Ms. Chim, so how do you feel about the Milwaukee or Madison USA field of are they like immigrant friendly or which one? Which one? Milwaukee. The Madison or Milwaukee, yeah. Oh, that's where Andrew is. So our our um I would ask him, but Andrew is one of the attorneys in our office. He's our supervising attorney. Um he's he's had probably four or five interviews in Milwaukee. I think we like Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if just something they conduct an interview, can I hire you guys, right? Yeah, and, sure. Okay. Yeah, so, Andrew, hey, Andrew. Thank you yeah. so much. God bless you. I appreciate it. And I like the, what is that? The the weekly like chilling person on the. <laughs> yeah. I like that one. Everybody wants the chill, the chill caller of the week. Thank you, Oscar. Hey, thank you. I appreciate it. God. Bye, buddy. See ya. All right, all right. Let's say hi to Lisa. Hi, Jim. Thank you for the show. Sure. <laughs> So please, I have a confused situation. I uh, I have a question, please, if it's that possible. Go. I mean, uh, in VC stage, so uh, they review our paper, we send me rating, they review our paper uh, after one month, they say that uh, we have to to resubmit uh, the final divorce. And we, di we did that in the same day. So after one month again, they, they send me an email that they run an update in my account. When I check it, I found all papers accepted and the divorce to accept it, but I don't found any like message says that all my papers approved and I'm documentally qualified. Yeah, you're just chilling. You're just waiting. Because that stick more now 20 days I'm waiting. I send them oh, you're gonna be waiting probably three or four months before you hear anything. Uh, but in VC now takes uh, like only 20 days to review papers. Is that like a problem who told, from who told you that? glitch? Who told you that? Because they have that review in, in the website. That's total bullshit. Mm. You're it's not a glitch. It's a, it's a it's part of the system. You're going to be waiting, like I said, three or four months to get an answer. Okay, thank you so much. Jim. All right, good luck. good luck. All right, next up, she she. Hello, she. Hi, Jim. How you doing? I'm well. How you doing? What's up? I'm good. Um, unfortunately, I'm down with the flu, but I'm doing oh. better now. That's no fun. So, yeah. Thanks for taking my call and allowing me to be on your show. Sure. What can I help you with? Um, thank you. So last year I came into your show. I don't know if you can remember me, but I was requesting about if I could make an expedite request regarding my kids. Um, my case was I seven thirty. Yeah. And um, I went ahead and mailed in last year. That was October, and I received a call last week from someone and they say that that's a new CIS officer from Texas and they say to me that we have your case right here with me and I will go ahead and, and approve it. I can see you have lovely kids. I can see the photos and the officer went ahead and described the photos and I was like, I, wa I, I wasn't believing, but then when they described the photos, I was like, oh, okay. Those are the photos that I sent. And I was, okay. I don't know if USCIS really calls people or was it a scam? No, I no. And I would say it sounds legit to me if they know the right photos. Um, I can't think of another way they would know the photos. And and I think I think that there are some nice immigration officers who, when it comes to I-730s, would really feel like a soft spot for you because they know those cases are hard and that you're probably pretty sad about being separated. Not that everybody, you know, everybody who calls this show is sad about being separated, but I think 730s are different. And I think that if you got the right officer on the right day with the right pretty pictures of your family, I can see how that would happen. Oh, okay. Yeah, because I've been waiting again to see, to check on my case status online. It's not changing. And they say that they, uh, he went at end and sent my case to NVC. So I don't know how long does it take? It's usually a month. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Cool. All right, Jim. Good luck or congratulations. I'm happy that worked out. Thanks, G. 
Thank you so much, Jim. God bless you so much for the good work that you do for us. See ya. All right, all right. She got some good news. We're getting some good news today. We like it when we get good news. Nur's here. What's up, Nur? Hey, uh, Jim. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Yeah. I don't want to show my face. I'm from authoritarian countries. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. Yeah, no uh, I have a, a old removal order. It's like 10 years old. Okay. And uh, my wife, she applied. She, basically, she got granted asylum like in 2020. Okay. At the end of 2020. So, and she like filed I-730 in 2021. Today okay. is like exactly two years. Uh -huh. And the last message, like last thing US, USCIS sent me was uh they received my application. Two also, two years ago, two years ago today. Is that what you yeah, said? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Also, like after like a couple of weeks, they sent me a receipt saying that they are able to reuse my old uh, biometrics. Like they okay. able to reuse my fingerprints. Yeah. But but when I checked on USCIS website, it still says like uh, they received the application. It doesn't say anything about that they like able to use my fingerprint. And I have a lawyer. I want to file for mandamus. Is it sure. like two years is good time to file? For sure. But my lawyer says like he's like good lawyer, but he says like I don't want to like file lawsuit to the government. Probably because he doesn't know how. And. Uh, he also saying that it's a little bit like risky. Is it like risky in my case? No. Since I, I have an so old like no. removal order. No, I mean that's part of your I seven thirty, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean we we got married like almost like eight years, nine nine years ago, and we have two kids. I've you need the I seven thirty to get approved so that you can go undo the removal order, right? Yeah, and then I told my lawyer like. If I my if I my I seven thirty gets approved, I'm like I told him like let's ask some uh, PD from the DHS so they can join our motion to re sure. reopen, right? Yeah. So here's the thing. So Nor, I've sued them almost. I think we're over sixteen hundred times now. They don't get mad. They don't treat your case any differently. They just take the case off the shelf and start working on it. So your case is stuck. Some USCIS officer is scratching their head. Oh, I'd like to work on Noor's case, but he's got this old removal order. I don't know what in the hell I'm supposed to do. So they just put it up on the shelf. So when I sue them, they take it off yeah. the shelf. So you can, you can sue them now. You can sue them two years from now. I think at the end of the day, if it's been two years, you're probably going to need to sue them. I mean, am I eligible for that I-730 since I have an old removal order? Well, that's a different question. I'd have to research it, but I'm pretty sure that you are. The I seven thirty is just for the um, just for the uh, asylum, like right, uh, right. Sorry, I got distracted. Oh, yeah. If I get approved on I seven thirty, right? So, can I get like I ninety four that USCIS? Yeah, you would. Maybe? You would. Yeah. Can I work sure. right after that? Can I like work just showing that paper? Well, I ninety four again. So. We're getting a lot of great questions today. Again, this is a situation I haven't seen before. I haven't, I've done a lot of I-730s, but almost all of them have been overseas and none of them have ever had a removal order. So I think that you might be able to, but when it comes time to adjust, you're going to have to undo that removal order, but I have to do the research. I don't know for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to like, I'm going to go to BIA, try to reopen it or like terminate it. But well, you won't go to the BIA, that, you won't go to BIA, you'll go back to the immigration court. Because last last my old my removal order was from BIA. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, it's fine. They'll just remand it. It's all good. But you got to get the seven thirty fixed first. Otherwise, nothing happens. Yeah. Do I have a like chance to re reopen that BIA? I think so. I think order? so. Yeah. I mean, it would depend on why you were put into removal. Yeah, because my asylum was denied. Yeah. And they basically, just said like. Basically, just said like I believe what what you say, but just being in jail like for a couple of days is not enough for asylum. 
So those, so as long as they didn't say you committed some kind of asylum fraud, those are the ones that, those are the ones that really make them more willing to. Yeah, if I file mandamus, if I call your office and file mandamus, like how long it, it, you said it, they will respond within like 60 days, right? 60 to 75 days. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, also, Lord. the interviews are waived for, for I-730. Is it like case by case, I guess? I think it's often waived, yeah. Okay. Bye, Noor. Yeah, See I have your uh, web, uh, cell phone and everything. Awesome. Thank you. See ya. All right, all right. Let's go ahead and talk to Kevin. Hi, Kevin. Hello, Jim. You hear me? I got you. Okay, I got a quick question. I received a RFQ today for my medical. And I submitted the, the whole application in April last year. And I did my, med my medical in March. But I didn't submit every my medical with everything. So can I submit my medical? I think it's expired. Expired? Yeah, I think if you had included it, it would have been fine, but I think now it's expired. So I would just go back to that doctor's office, bring the sealed envelope and say, hey, I forgot to send this in when I sent in the application. Can you maybe reissue it for me without charging me the full price? Can they, can they do that? Well, they'll have to open it up and look at it. And if they need to give you any other vaccinations, yeah, uh, they can do that. Yeah, yeah, they can do that. They told me that they're going to charge me the whole price. The, the, they can do that too. Okay. All right. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Bye, Kevin. Bye. All right. All right. Remember, if you're in the waiting room, I need to see your face to know that you're a live person before I can pull you up onto the camera. Hello, P. Lit. Hey, Jim. How you doing? I'm well. How are you doing? Good, good. I don't know if you remember, we chatted if, uh, about a month or so ago regarding my dad's uh, case. Uh, he was involved in the trucking, uh, truck driving school uh bribery licenses and uh he had a three years uh and then the immigration he had three year uh, prison sentence he served that the ice took him to the detention center um i was able to basically get bond for him uh through an attorney that just wanted to do the bond hearing that's all she said she can't do the case because it's extremely tough um but we got him out. He's been out for a month. Um, and then I kind of lost what to do from here on. He's still waiting to hear his his master hearing, um, which we're trying to get scheduled to somewhere closer here. Um, what do you think is going to happen? Do you think they'll pick him back up and put him back in custody? Or do you think they'll give him a chance to fight it out? Um, he had two felonies. Uh, class uh, C and a class D. Did he get out on bond? Yeah. How do you get out on bond? How is he not an aggravated felon? He is showing as an aggravated felon, uh, but somehow the documents that they filed, the ICE, they had some mistakes in it. Ah. So if he's an ag fell, he's going, most likely. Most likely. Mm hmm. Okay. So there's no way to fight it. Like, what, well, I wouldn't say it? no way. I, I mean, I haven't looked at any of the documents. I, I mean, making a determination as to the criminal, what, what of the immigration consequences of a criminal conviction is one of the most complicated things that an immigration lawyer could do. So it would be very irresponsible of me to say never. Right. But generally, I can say that judges don't have a lot of leeway for a double felon, an aggravated felon, to let them stay in the United States. Hmm. But his um, both of his uh, records for his felonies show up as fraud. Yeah, so that's a whole other reason. Yeah, they weren't violent or anything like that. So yeah, but fraud. How much money are, was there? Money involved? Yeah, about two uh, two hundred seventy or sixty thousand. Yeah, anything over ten thousand and fraud. That's an ag fail. You're going. Hmm. Okay. So do you think at his master calendar hearing, they will just put him back in or they'll take him or? Yeah. I think they'll issue a new NTA to clean up whatever paperwork they didn't have. They'll submit it and then he'll go back into custody and then he'll get deported. Uh, Again, this is. Without have a passport either. He doesn't have a passport either. So. Well, they'll, they'll make him get one or he'll sit in jail until he gets one. 
Okay. They've heard that. They've seen that trick before. Yeah. I mean, that, so what happened is when he turned in to the federal government, when he turned, surrendered to FBI, they asked for the passport. They have that passport. Oh, they'll give it to ICE then. Uh, but I asked ICE, uh, I was like, why didn't you guys just get it from them? Because they've asked him for it and I helped translate. And they said, we don't have access to their system or we can't. He has to ask for it. So they're just like going why Well, they might make him do that. Yeah. I, I don't know. This is why I don't do deportation. Hmm. So, yeah, it seems extremely hard. Yeah. And depressing. When yeah. I mean, I, I had to show money out of my own pocket to get them out. And it's, I'm not talking, you know, I'm, I'm already in like 20 grand. Yeah. I'm sure. I mean, it's a miracle he got out. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Pete, I'll let you go. Bye, Thanks. buddy. See ya. All right. Uh, Assad's wondering, I've been waiting for my asylum interview for seven years. What should I do? I'm away from kids and wife for the same period, and I got a frustrated life. So what should I do? Should I sue USCIS? So seven years is definitely too long to be waiting for your asylum case to be over. Seven years is too long to be waiting for your asylum interview, Assad. Now, here's the thing. On asylum, we do those a little bit differently. Um, when we think about filing a mandamus lawsuit on an asylum case, we like to take a look at the documents to see what we think might happen on the asylum case. And sometimes what we'll suggest is that you hire us. If your case is seven years old, that means it was filed before Donald Trump was president. Well, there's been a lot of changes in your home country. There's been a lot of changes in the United States. There've been changes to the asylum law rules. So we would, what I would generally suggest Assad for something like that is hire us to look everything over, make your case stronger then sue them because when you sue them, they start moving very quickly and you want to have everything lined up before you sue them so that you don't get a request for evidence or get called in for an interview and you're not ready and you're caught not ready. So what you should do aside is hire us to look over the asylum case, see if we think it's worth suing over, see if we think it's a winner, see if we think we can update it and make it better. And then once everybody's on the same page and feels like it's better, then we sue them. That's how we do that for asylum cases. All right, cool. Um, Marie's here. Hi, Marie. Hi. How are you? I am good. Um, I have some questions to ask. My husband has a green card. He's a green card holder from 2017. But he, um, from 2017 to 2019, what he usually do is come to the U.S. like for one or two weeks. But he had applied for the travel document. So he had that two-year travel document. He's now in the U.S. from 2020, December. Reside there now fully. So he wants to know if he can file for his citizenship now. So when was his last trip that lasted more than six months? Um, that was from 2020. He's in the U.S. from 2020, December. And he has not. He only came to Jamaica like for a week and went back. So, in tw- so December of 2020, he starts hanging out here sort of full time. But before that, he'd pretty much been in Jamaica. Right. Okay, so 2021, 2022, 2023, 2020. So 2024, when he's four years in one day is when he should apply. Oh, so he cannot apply this year? He can, but it'll get denied. Okay. You're saying he had a trip more than six months, right? He has a trip. No, not more than six months for 20, from 2020. Okay, so Marie, this is something that we should sit down and look at the documents and look at the dates and figure it out. This isn't something we should just do on a phone call like this. Okay, so so he could call your office. If he wants to hire us, yeah. Um, what's the cost to do that citizenship? Citizenship, 4000 Okay. Um, also, he, he has filed an I-130 for his wife in Jamaica. Mm-hmm. She, um, that was in 2019. She was documentarily qualified in 2022, August. She's now waiting an inter- for an interview. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Um, 
if you watch the comments, Marie, for the next couple of minutes, people will say when they became DQ'd and when they got their interview in Jamaica. I just don't know the time frame. I don't pay attention to each country's time frames. Um, what I want to find out, if he applied for his citizenship, would that have any negative effect on on my on yours? Why yours? Yeah. No, would it? Would it? Um, I know that I would go into. I will become an immediate relative, right? I R. Um, is, instead is, of an F two A. Yeah, is it? Is he applying only for you or somebody else too? Only for me. Yeah, no, it's okay if he gets a citizenship. That's okay. Okay. But hopefully, you'll be there long before then. Okay. All right. Okay. Thanks, Marie. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Jim. All right, that was Marie from Jamaica. She's getting it done. Um, here's an interesting question. I recently got my green card approved, but my I-131 is still pending. What are the chances my I-131 will get approved? Who cares? You don't need it. Um, and in fact, you'll get a letter saying that your I-131 has been dismissed because your green card was approved. So hopefully that helps. All right. Um, let's talk to Isa. Hi, Isa. Hi, Jim. Uh, actually, I was selected for the DV 2023. Awesome. The diversity visa, thank you. And uh, the NVC have already sent me my appointment. It's in Seoul here in Korea, and it's in April. And I'm not so sure if I have to file, like fill the form of uh, I-134, a fair bit of support, or no, I don't have to. You don't have to. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good luck. Congrats, Isa. That's great. What country are you from? I'm from Yemen, but currently I reside in Korea. I'm a student here. I'm happy for you. Good job. Thank you. Thank you very Bye, much. Bye, Isa. Yep. All right. Let's say hi to Za. Za, are you with us? Hello, Jim. How are you? I'm good, Za. How are you? Good. Thank you. Uh, so I would like to ask you, please, if I can apply for a marriage green card for my husband, who is my cousin from the mom's side, and he's overseas. And the marriage was overseas. I'm currently in Illinois, U.S., and I don't know if it's okay, and we will not have any problems when I apply. So, also, so, so, so talk, talk to me about how, how the relationship is. So how, walk me through how you're connected to him. So I, he's my cousin from the mom's side. Uh, my uh, my right. mom and his dad are siblings. For their, okay, so it's first cousins. Okay. And now we have, so, and you live in Illinois. Yes. Also, we have the same last name. And my mom and his dad are siblings. So they have the same middle name sure. and last name. Okay, so here's how, here's how this works. Now, we've probably had this case come up. We, we probably handled 20 of these cases. Okay. Okay. And historically, what usually happens is USCIS approves the I-130. They get sent to the National Visa Center. The fees are all paid, and then it gets to the embassy. And then at the embassy stage, they say, uh, wait a minute, um, you guys are first cousins, and, and Za lives in Illinois. Well, Illinois won't let you marry your first cousin. So then what we have to do is have Za move somewhere in America, where first cousin marriages are legal. And I think it's about 20 states it's legal, okay? Well, like if we uh, we got married, like in... Uh, doesn't matter where like you get married. Doesn't overseas. Matter. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter where you get married. It matters whether or not the state that the petitioner lives in recognizes it or not. So your problem is that you have this marriage but you live in Illinois. So let's say, so, so what I'm saying is usually we would say, go ahead and file the I-130 and then you have to move later. But just uh, about a month ago, we had a case where USCIS found the first cousin and, and issued a request for evidence and said, we're not going to approve this because you live in a state that doesn't recognize first cousin marriages. So my advice to you would be to move to a state where first cousin marriages are recognized. The fact that you're already married is okay. It's about where you live when you apply. 
So, like, I can't apply if I was in Illinois? You cannot. It'll get denied at some point. You're going to have to move. Um, so, like, there's no other way to do it. The, the only way... The Even only if, uh, like, uh, our religion is okay with the getting married to... What about your religion? It matters about the state you live in. So, I've, like I said, I've done this 20 times. I know... I, there's some things, there's some things I say on this show I'm not really sure about, but I I, I I'm 100 sure about this. So like I have to move uh, before I apply or when? I believe you have. I believe now, based on what we've been seeing, that you have to do it before you apply. Okay, and uh, like how long it will take? A year and a half. Year and a half. Two years, so, something like that. Uh, and like, what are the fees if I apply with the like? Um, with our office? Yes. Yeah. So, um, the legal fee for us to handle an overseas visa case is usually fifty five hundred. We'd probably charge a little bit extra mm -hmm. for a first cousin marriage just because it's extra work on our part. But usually, people pay us like half up front, and then we break up the rest. Okay. Okay. But yeah, we can we can help with this. We've worked on this many times and and you know, moving to that other state, we can talk about that too about what that actually means. So like I have I have to move like there's uh, uh, no way that I can apply from Illinois. If you apply from Illinois, you might get it approved by USCIS, but which embassy are you talking about? Uh, um, so like uh, we're going to do the, uh, maybe in Turkey or in Iraq. Okay. So, so the, the, you said that your mom and his dad are siblings. Have, well, I know that, but that they have the same names. So I've actually had that case right out of Iraq. I've actually had that case get approved. No problem. Yes. But, but I've also had many more cases where they, they know that backwards and forwards and they're looking for it. So. I don't think you want to waste your time doing it without moving from Illinois. Okay, so like just move and uh, to make sure for like it's going to be fine. That's right. You want to increase your chances of success. You want to take away reasons for them to say no. And the best way to do that is to move to another state. Okay. But like I said, if you to hire us, we can talk it through. I can explain, we can explain it to you a little bit differently. Okay, sure. Okay. Thanks, sure. Ah. Thank you so much. Bye. Okay, see ya. All right. Next up, John. Hi, John. Um, hi. So uh how are you doing today? I'm well. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. Um, I just recently received my green card. Awesome. And um, but I've I've known for a few months that my wife has been cheating on me. I received it through my wife, she's an American citizen. Okay. And I'm sorry to hear that. Me. Yes. So uh, I was wondering what I should do as, as I'm thinking about, I'm planning on divorcing her. Mm -hmm. So you got, you feel like you have the proof of the cheating? Yes. Okay. And um, what, what's the date of your, how long ago did you get married? Um, About, we got married in March of 2019. And when did your green card get approved? It got approved a few weeks ago. So you got a 10-year green card? Yes. Okay, so that's good. So you don't have to do the 751. Okay. Yes. So you're going to wait five years and apply for citizenship, right? Yes. And will there be any problems with applying for citizenship if after I divorce her? I mean, keep that proof as to why you got divorced and you're going to want to demonstrate that it wasn't you that did anything wrong. It was her. But, if you know, if you're, you're not going to apply for five years, you can't apply under the three-year rule because you'll be divorced. Um, Correct. So I think if you really feel like you have the proof, then the timing of it being shortly after the green card shouldn't as matter as much, if that makes sense. Okay. I'm sorry, John. Thank you, but uh, have a good day. Hang in there, buddy. I will, for sure. All right. Let's see what Jess has to say. Hi, Jess. Hi, how are yeah. you doing? Good. How are you doing? Good. So I'm originally from Singapore. And awesome. my husband is obviously American. He's from Oregon. 
And our situation's a little tricky because we got, I came to the US in 2018 in May. Okay. And have some sort of tricky family situation back home. I won't go into too much detail. But we, um, for religious reasons, I guess, uh, we got married less than a month before, when I was here. Uh, uh, and we've been married about five years now, coming up in June. Um, and we decided to wait because, you know, uh, I mean, not rush into things, right? Because we already rushed into marriage, but then like to apply for the green card, we were told to wait. Um, for what? You've been waiting five years. You could be I, you could be on your way to citizenship right now. Right. We just started the process with a lawyer here in Phoenix. Okay. Um, but my question is like, what's do you think because we got married so fast, even though it's been a couple years, and we have a son actually, we have a three year old. Um, do you think there would be an issue still? I mean, should we still be worried, even though? It's so, been so yeah, you should be worried. You should be prepared for this. So so let me just get this straight. When did you enter? Um, March, not March. March is when we met. May twenty eighteen. You so how'd you meet online? Yes. And you came on a visit visa? A Singapore visa waiver, yeah. Ah, and, and, okay. Was that your first entry into the United States? Okay. So you arrived and then you got married four weeks later? I, less than that, yeah. Less than that, okay. Kind yeah, of. So in gonna, retrospect, it might not have been the best, but it was out of a good intention, I guess. Well, they're going to say it was out of a bad intention. They're going to say that you jumped the line by coming on visa waiver. Our lawyer but, now told us because it's been a few years, that's not a thing anymore. But Oh, it's still a thing. It's, yeah. You're going to have to be ready for it. I think I think that your case is going to get approved. Okay. But I think you guys better be damn well ready to talk about this, what your plans were, what your intentions were. Right. And, you know, the reality is when we the immigration officer did ask me, like, do you plan to marry him? And at that point, honestly and truly, like, I wasn't sure. That's why I said no. I mean, we weren't engaged or anything. Yeah. It was just really fast. <laughs> we were young and naive, probably. I mean, And the religious marriage is the <laughs> one that you you don't have another marriage. That's the only one. No, have. we have. We got married civilly in Oregon in June of 2018. And then we have a solemnization we are Mormon LDS, and so we got the sealing ceremony done a year after. In Wait, the so what? What? What's the date of the entry again? May twenty eighteen. And when did you? When did you do your marriage that you recorded with the government? Uh, June twenty eighteen. Oh, so still a month. Yeah. Just about. Well, it is what it is. I think it's good you applied for the green card. You might have you might have to get a misrepresentation waiver. You might have a bit of a stink on your hands, but I wouldn't go in there acting like, well, we've been married five years and we have a kid, so everything's good. Right. It might be. That might very well happen. And I think yeah. that I think I think what I would do is I would make sure that I have an affidavit from someone yep. in, the, in the church to say this was for religious purposes. And then I don't want you to answer this online or on this camera with me right now but you your lawyer and your spouse should spend a lot of time talking about whether you knew about that 60-day rule before you applied so don't say anything but that your knowledge and your intent on what you were doing as you came through customs is probably the whole shoot and match do you think it's likely that I, mean, I get nervous thinking about it because i mean who wants to Think yeah, about that's you. why that's why you waited five years to apply because you're nervous. And we oh. actually consulted with quite a few lawyers on the phone, and a lot of them advise us to wait. And so, waiting's dumb. I mean, it, it's fine. I mean, you, you're definitely going to be able to demonstrate a legit marriage. But okay. the question isn't whether your marriage is legit. The question is whether you trick them into letting you into the United States by saying to a CBP officer, "I ain't getting married," and then getting married four weeks later. That's the problem. Yeah. So, for instance, like sometimes I've had this happen too, Jess, where maybe, and again, don't answer this on camera. Let me maybe, turn this off and listen to you. <laughs> well, yeah, it's okay to be on your face. It's just that the recording of it. Right. But what I was going to say is that sometimes the person coming from overseas mm -hmm. doesn't know that they're going to get married, but the person in the United States does. Like they're planning on asking to get married right when they get here. Right. And so sometimes the, the foreign national is surprised and that, that helps because, like I said, the whole thing is your intent when you entered. Mm -hmm. 
I think it was we tried to. Not, I mean, nope, I don't want to hear it. Yeah, no. I, I don't want you to say it. I do want to hear it, but I don't. I don't want you to say it. Totally. No, I mean, have you ever dealt with a case like this before? Maybe not as quick. Ugh. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Something yeah, I've similar. had a bunch. Yeah. And most of them, they so were. They all got approved, but it's going to take work, and you can't go in there like a regular old case is what I'm saying. You need to do the work. You need to bring in extra evidence. Okay. You're going to need to convert them. And you're going to have to hope that maybe you have a Mormon officer or somebody who likes Mormons or somebody who's I, open to that. You know, <laughs> you okay. should move to Salt Lake is what you should do. Gosh. I mean, Phoenix is a lot of Mormons here. <laughs> so who knows? Yeah. All right. Well, good luck, Jess. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Okay. Bye. All right, everybody. That'll do it for today's show. Now, listen. Some people have been asking us to do our show a little bit earlier in the day. Now, usually we don't get a lot of people watching early, but tomorrow, to accommodate my travel schedule, we'll be on at 10 a.m. in the morning. So all of our friends in Australia and India, join us at 10 a.m. I don't know. That might be crazy time. But it'll be a different start time for us tomorrow. It'll be six hours earlier than usual. But tomorrow's show, 10 a.m. Central. So... If this is a time that doesn't always work for you, this is your chance to join us. That'll be episode number 320. Wow, one-fifth of the way to 400. Hard to believe. Seems like we just went over 300. Hooli, thanks for watching over the phone. Thanks for taking care of everybody. And thanks to MD for watching the count. I was watching the count, too. I think we got up to 3.30 today, which is a record. So how about that? I think people like this 4 o'clock slot. But tomorrow, 10 a.m. And then I'm off to Baltimore for some immigration fun on Saturday morning and a little naturalization interview. Should be fun on Saturday morning. Peace out, everybody. 